Ich habe keine Ahnung. Ich weiß nur zwei Dinge über den nächsten Talk. Der erste ist, es wird kurz dunkel, nicht erschrecken und nicht Hinfall währenddessen. Der zweite ist, es sind acht Mikrokosmen, acht Experten und je acht Minuten. Was weiter passiert, werden wir sehen. Einen großen Applaus, bitte. Willkommen zur deutschen äh, englischen Übersetzung. Welcome to the uh, English translation of Bits and Trees, um, live from the 36 case Com Communication Congress in Leipzig. Your translators are Gunis Bro, Snakey and Mio. Hallo, hallo. Sporangium. Sporangium from the Greek, a vessel, a approximately spherical container in which the spores are created. Also, wir starten jetzt. Sporangium, griechisch Angion. The sporangium, a vessel from Greek. An almost spherical container on ferns in which the spores are created. In most cases, sporangia have a special opening mechanism in order to spread the seeds over the greatest distances possible. The sporangium of the gold serpent fern around the spore containers of the golden serpent fern curls a row of cells with strong inner walls and thin outer walls. Initially, the cells are filled with plenty of water, but as the spores mature, they gradually dry out. The pressure inside the cells changes due to the evaporating heat water. When a critical value is reached, a phenomenon occurs called cavitation. Through the formation of bubbles inside the cells, the cells expand. The strong inner walls now act like a spring under tension. They bend the cell now in the opposite direction. The catapult is loaded. Now the spores are thrown out of the spore capsule at up to 10 meters per second, where the spores fall on fertile soil. New gold serpent ferns can thrive. Ah, nee, es war noch das Intro geplänkel. Um, a warm welcome tonight in Borg. Thank you for coming here, either on feet or per data. We're happy you've chosen to make the experiment and share tonight. We are Rainer and Juliane. Rainer, what is it you're doing here and what has this to do with bits and trees? Well, nice, good, you're asking. Well, I myself call myself a critical computer scientist and I am active in several fora. What we do is um, make complex technology understandable. We will contextualize everywhere where tech te technology is uh, relevant for society. That's where we come in. Um, this is for fair IT, cyber IT, data privacy. Well, and so we, do, um, I, am, I am a critical and informed scientist uh, in, at the Open Knowledge Foundation. Um, what we do is um, we explain technology and make sure that people can discuss technology, that technology is democratized and it's shared, and that civil society can share technology. Open source or uh, den Staat or youth hacking. Yeah, so we, the fifth in the UKF, um, have in 2018 with other organizations in Berlin um, started this project 
other organizations, what that means is this is techie organizations like the CCC, but also organizations from, uh, from environmental uh, activists. The um, Boot für die Welt, German Watch, and um, also um, Netzpolitik.org. What did we do, though? Uh, so, first, we discovered we're all activists, and the idea of Bits and Trees is that the techies and the eco uh, um, have the same goals. Um, same, the, 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 we all live in this world, not just some random people, and what we need for this is a planet that is inhabitable tomorrow by humans under, with human conditions. Um, what we also need is rooms, is spaces that are not subject to um, where, where can we where can we um, find the 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 found the basis for this on on a party right so party after a conference a party where uh, everybody abounds with with knowledge that was the conference bits and trees bits and trees um, it's and since then um, the uh, BUND has helped to bring open source forward um, and is behind this idea, just like the CCC um, has subscribed to the goals of environment. Uh, um, this happened a year ago, so what happened since then? Well, so... Uh, the fruit of our um, projects are um, address books. Um, what we do, we help with the track of uh, resilience and sustainability, and uh, also there are CCC internal groups like sustainability groups. So what do we do today on this stage? What we'll do is, just like I reported today, um, like the Sporangia, um, spread knowledge at high speed into this room and into the world, um, such that we can all flower and bloom. Um, how does this happen? Well, we will see eight people on the uh, stage that have eight minutes each to spread their knowledge into your brains, into your heads, such that... And so to make sure that only eight, hour, eight, eight minutes are used, uh, we have um, a watch here that will keep the time. So on the other side of that, we see the timekeeper. Welcome. All right. So <laughs> he spoke about automatic video surveillance. Uh, it can be seen at Media CCCD. This is Banks. Banks has the time cards that you will see too, to uh, be in the suspense as well, to be... I think that's all for now. All right. So, on stage, please, our first uh, Sporangi. All right, please hit the buzzer. Thank you very much. Jetzt, now. Hello, Katrin Henneberger. Nice to meet you. Please give her a round of applause. Katrin, you've come to us from the Rhineland, and some of you may know her. She's active at the Hambacher Forest, and she's the media liaison for uh, the climate activists Ende Gelände. And uh, you've been protesting against the coal company RWE, so they have tried to threaten you with all kinds of legal measures, but that didn't work, did it? Because you're still here and you keep protesting and we hope you keep on protesting. It's 
not just that, you're also generally an expert in this climate crisis questions. And she told us before, we should avoid the word climate change. Now, please tell us why, because I think it's very important. Well, we shouldn't use climate change anymore because it's a very soft word. If we talk about change, it's a very gradual thing. But this is a crisis now. It's a very existential crisis. And we, how we treat these things is how we talk about these things. So if we talk about the climate crisis or the climate catastrophe, it becomes suddenly more urgent. Well, from school I know this as global warming, which sounds pretty cuddly, but there's a lot of things happening, which we're going to hear about. Other than uh, defending our favorite forests, you've been to the UN climate conferences for 10 years, and you're um, working for indigenous action and the gender action plan. And you're working for a sustainable future. Now, I'm not going to talk much longer, but we're going to hear now what's going wrong in this world, in our world. So, three, two, one. Sporangium. Our house is on fire. Uh, Greta Thunberg said this about a year ago, and she prophesied what was going to happen in 2019. In summer, we have seen the Arctic tundra burning. This was something scientists had predicted for the year 2090. At the same time, in the equatorial, the Amazonas rainforest was burning. They are partially still burning. And today, in Australia, we have crazy bushfires. Our planet is burning already. Our house is on fire already. This is actually not very surprising. Here you see a little video from NASA. It started in 1880, how the temperature changed in the past 100 years. And we are already living in a world where uh, we're about one year, uh, one degree warmer than it should be. And this is a huge problem. One degree Celsius doesn't sound like much. Uh, it's not even a reason to wear another sweater, but for the global climate system, works different from the weather. A very small number of degrees decides if we have glaciers in Berlin or if our coastal cities are drowning. And there have been some abrupt changes in the world climate, in our world history, but those all have in common a great mass extinction of species. And I would like to say we're at the beginning of the next mass extinction in our global history, but actually we're right in the middle of it. In 2012, there have been a study, study from the World Bank that said if we continue on, if we don't reduce emissions um, we're going to head for a world that is four to six degrees warmer. Since 2012, we haven't done much. The situation has, got, has worsened as pertaining to the global emissions. And here we have a map how a world would look at four degrees warmer. The yellow and brown zones are non-habitable zones. People always tell me, yeah, yeah, but we can adapt, we can develop technology, we are going to uh, the high rises in Siberia, we're going to move to Siberia, to Antarctica, or we're going to Mars. But this is all bullshit, so globally. If we don't act now, if we let global temperatures rise by one and a half degrees or even two degrees, then we're going to have feedback and we're going to reach tipping points. The most famous one is the tundra in Siberia or Canada. If this starts thawing, then a lot of methane and carbon dioxide is going to be released to the atmosphere, and this is going to worsen the climate crisis. Another tipping point is the Greenland ice sheet. If this goes away, this huge mass of ice, then uh, the climate has one cooling effect less because ice reflects um, the solar beams back into the atmosphere. And also sea levels are going to rise by about 7 meters globally. A third tipping point is the Amazonas, the rainforest there. 
it is going to turn into a step, into grassland in the long term. So this is what you see in this picture now, the nice and green rainforest. This is going to turn into sand and dust. This was three tipping points. There are more tipping points all over the world, uh, as you can see by the Potsdam Institute. This shows how vulnerable we are. And if we don't act now, then it's going to be too late very soon. But why do we fail in the face of this climate crisis? Why don't we do what needs to be done? There's two reasons for that. The first one is that there's a small, rich part of the population who profit from uh, the burning of fossil, fo fossil fuels and from exploiting human nature. And they keep telling us that if we try to change the system, then our world is going to go to ruin. But we're all nice and we believe them and we d don't dare uh, to start a David versus Goliath fight. Because, especially us in the north, because we're in a rather cushy pos position and don't feel the repercussions yet. Every day, uh, cruel reality is the climate crisis already. Because we keep talking about like this is in the future. Because we're still in denial. We recognize the saber toothed tiger and we act. But we don't act if this threat is going to happen at some point in the future. We are very bad at anticipating these things. And this is another reason why we don't act now. The climate crisis is not a danger of the future. It's the cruel reality. For example, in Chad, in the Sahel Zone in Africa, and the heat waves have increased in number and in frequency uh, a lot. Over 50 degrees, this is dangerous for children, the pregnant and the elderly. And the co this, of course, worsens the conflict between different ethnicities about the last remaining bit of fertile soil and the fights about soil. Water is running out there. The most hardest uh, hit are the women and the indigenous people. Here we can see indigenous people and the p women are responsible for getting water and wood and their ways are getting longer due to the climate crisis and this is a huge security risk and their cows produce less and less milk and um, if there's not a lot of food during the day it's the women who give their food to the children first overall it's uh, women in these communities um, especially in the global south. And women are the hit the hardest in these regions by the climate crisis. But they have the least voice at the negotiation table. Their voice isn't heard, especially at the UN climate conferences. This made me aware. Uh, I was made aware of this at the UN climate conference in 2010, when there was a typhoon in the Philippines and my colleague Chanel from the Philippines couldn't call her family and her, ho her friends for days and we didn't know are they still alive, are they not? And at the same time we saw the governments accomplish nothing and that made me really very angry and it showed me we can't rely on anybody. Nobody is going to come save us. We need to act ourselves. The climate crisis needs stopping and this means we need the action of every single person on earth and every single person in this room. Use your abilities, do something. In the Rhineland we have the Hambacher Forest, we've occupied it, we uh, could successfully stop um, the deforestation here. The activists have been taking to the streets, to the coal mine, every day for six years. They use their bodies to stop uh, the mining. And this shows that we need to do something here, even in Germany, and you need to cross the line of legality. You need to do illegal things here sometimes to show the people how dangerous the situation is. 
but unfortunately they keep on. Instead of a coal exit, we're going to get a new coal power plant next year. It's going to go online next summer, and we're going to need all your help to stop this. The next months are going to be very loud. We're going to have a lot of protests, and we have a greeting from Brazil. It's almost too late for concrete uh, actions. We can't wait anymore. I wanted to introduce her. She's the president of the Indigenous Peoples um, Coalition. So we have here a voice from the Global South, and this is why we have this video uh, message here. It's almost too late for concrete actions. We can't wait any longer. Mother Earth can't wait any longer. The Earth isn't longer blue and green, but it's deep red. There's flames and there's blood. Uh, we have to stop this bloodshed. We, the indigenous people, can't pay the price with our lives any longer. Just to keep the consumer society going. The moment to act is now. We can't wait to twi for 2025 uh, or for 2030. We need to act now. We are at minus two, but I guess for that message, uh, our number guy was lenient. You need to pay attention to the time more. Or we're going to kick you off the stage at some point. This can't continue. Okay, it's okay. We were patient. Uh, don't worry, it's not just bad news, but you can take it these eight minutes just to show you um, the consequences of climate change. So you can take this to your friends, families and neighbors and to take them with you to the streets at the next climate protest. So thank you to you, Katrin, for um, giving us this brief overview. Well, uh, you can now go over and sit with Banks, but before that, well, I, I knew it had to be first, but um, we, we need to choose the next person that will surprise us with their sporangium. Please hit the enter button. Tension grows. Okay, I think he will let us know what it is. Okay. Well, so we've been with the climate crisis. Um, now we have somebody um, uh, to talk about uh, an area which is very important to make change, which is the uh, energy sector. Um, of course, we all know this is one of the largest um, source of CO2 that we have, coal, uh, you know, uh, electrical energy from coal, and we need to change that. And sometimes that works and sometimes less so. Um, it is important that we have lots of information um, and public information at that. That's not always the case. Um, for example, it's hard to find out um, which of these ecological energy providers are actually ecological and green. So we'd like to, for that to be transparent so that we can make an informed choice um, which provider to actually make. Um, are we getting a green provider or is it really a coal energy provider? Um, so for this, um, we have a, a law, like in all of these cases, but however, once you actually get these information, um, they're very interesting, but um, oftentimes they are um, actually sad news and often um, with large gaps. So that's why um, in the next talk, um, Lisa Passing will tell us why eco energy is not the same as eco energy down the green energy rabbit hole. Hello, Lisa. Hello. 
Right, okay, Lisa, welcome. Good to see you here. So Lisa op uh, develops software as open source developer. She also um, codes video games. She also shares her knowledge and her abilities in uh, coding workshops uh, for, for underrepresented um, crypto workshops and uh, digital defense. Um, her, her long uh, goals are um, uh, destroying the patriarchy and welcome. Good, we all believe the same thing here. Okay. Uh, eco energy. Well, I think Katrin should first sit down. No, we don't want. Do, do you know how these these things look like? Uh, what 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 they are? Um, uh, so these are air snouts. So Katrin will get an air snout um, to be able to to be able to blow her off the stage. No, this is not not aggression. Um, please, Katrin, sit down. And if Banks this time really will hold up the zero, you can please trump, it, trump your snout. OK, eco energy. Two, one, zero, sporangium. OK, off, off we go. So th th this talk will give you an introduction um, into our research on eco-energy, um, some context. Um, I work at the data school. This is a project of Open Knowledge Foundation, lesser known. Um, we give workshops to data and also workshops for um, NROs. Where, where do I find data? How do I clean the data? How do I analyze the data? Um, that's one part of what we do. The other part is, is that we um, cooperate in projects that have to do with data and, and, and help them, whatever that means. So our current product is Robin Wood. Robin Wood, every few years, um, publish an uh, eco uh, energy report and answer the question which um, offer eco eco current offer eco energy efforts are really um, worth um, a suggestion the the big um, energy companies um, greenwash themselves like to greenwash themselves um, to uh, well uh, get some money uh, and we will show um, through four criteria um, that that look behind the curtain um, and and show you what what are these um, companies and are they really doing the best for the planet and for the energy in a given day. Um, four criteria. The first criteria of this is is that the. Number one, um, the company only deals with green energy. This is a very in, uh, important um, criteria because um, a tar tariff that is called eco-tariff doesn't mean that the company actually only sells green energy. Um, so that is the number one criteria, do they only deal with eco-energy. So our first research question was, which eco-energy companies only deal with 100% green energy? Well, we were a bit naive, um, so we went to the Bundesnetzagentur. They have a list. Um, it's not a list of companies um, for that deal in energy, but companies that produce energies. It's not quite the same. Um, it's 100, 820 companies, and it's a PDF. Um, it's a, a table in PDF form. However, it just contains the company name and the, the address. There's no no information whatsoever what kind of tariff they might have. So we researched farther. We found 
Um, another uh, report with the uh, monitoring mo report from the BNA. Um, again, it's a PDF. Um, it has several graphs. Um, so, yes, good news uh, where there's a graph and there must be data. Um, however, it wasn't quite clear uh, how how does the graph and the market relate. I mean, what does that mean for the for a specific company? So we uh, sent companies, uh, we sent emails. Um, can we get the data, the actual data? So the first answer was no. We didn't think that was very cool. Um, so then we um, became a little more formal. Um, well, and saying, well, we actually have a right to these data, so please hand over the data. Um, and so they looked at the data again and they said, mm, actually, our data are not fit to draw any conclusions at the level of a single company. Um, but we think that would be a good thing. Okay, so and next year we will have um, uh, data that will actually be uh, where you can draw conclusions on the level of a supplier. Um, the uh, Umweltbundesamt actually has a market analysis for eco energy. Um, uh, where they uh, talk about where does the energy come from, what systems are used. Um, this this is a rabbit hole if you look at it. Um, again, it's a PDF. Um, nice, lots of nice, uh, colorful graphics. We asked for the data behind the graphics. Well, the answer was um, actually the data were done by an external company. They own the data. Um, we just have the license for this this one single report. That is not so funny. If you think about it, um, uh, that we can't get at the data. I mean, we could have we could have bought the data, but we didn't want to do that. So what we did next is we scraped the data um, from everything that we could uh, get hold of, um, starting from the BNA list, um, from several comparison portals. Um, from lists of eco labels and best of lists in general, just just to see how can we get a m as complete as possible a picture. This wasn't easy. There was a lot of manual work, manual labor involved um, to match names and such because, of course, they're written differently, and then there's so many different abbreviations. But then uh, we hit it lucky and. Um, found uh, the, uh, the supplier of Eco Energy called Lichtblick. They had the same problem as we did. They too tried to collate such a list and um, fell, fell back to a manual uh, uh, gathering of data. Uh, so um, they didn't like the fact that the um, EEG, um, the, the tariffs for green power, um, can be used to essentially greenwash your company. Um, so they um, recalculated the data um, to account for that fact, which is exactly what we wanted as well. We uh, sent a couple of emails. We were allowed to use their list to check our lists. We unfortunately weren't uh, allowed to actually use our list. Um, so they weren't really familiar with the concept of open data. Tough topic. So here's a teaser. Our list has 1,210 um, suppliers. The first 1,061 suppliers fail the first of the four criteria because they sell also energy made from non-green sources, gray sources. Only 149 suppliers make it in the second round. This is a teaser. And actually, this is the end of my talk. And I'm at the end already, because we'll be back in January 2020 with uh, another report from Robin Wood. Period. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This is great. And you've even stayed within timing. Yes, uh, we're all very surprised. Well, you were fast enough. Yes. Well, dear, dear translators, you've been warned. And yes, it was fast. Um, 
So the S notes, um, can we, do, if you look at this, uh, do you have any associations? Yes, great, okay, <laughs> well, let it stand there. Um, so please hit enter again, okay, the tension mounts and the tension mounts, okay, so. Um, technology can, especially in the energy sector, help to reach our climate goals or just so, or maybe help that it isn't con entirely bleak. We still need to think um, everything that we think isn't quite as bad will be twice as bad for those in the global south. So we really, really, really need to speed up. Um, in the energy sector, you see that digitalization um, has many different aspects. Technology um, can be used for sustainability goals, but the technology itself also needs energy and resources, and that also that technology needs to be sustainable as well. Where does all this come from? Where is it produced? What are the consequences? Uh, so everything needs to be not just ecological, but also looked at under the social aspects. How can we make these technologies so social and um, sustainable. So let's look at digitalization and um, the, the, the crisis of climate and of social and how they feed on each other. And for this we hear Anja Höfner. The, the fairy tale of the dematerialization of through technical tools. Uh, a warm welcome for Anja. Hello, Anja. Hello. Hello. You, you had the wish we prepared something for you. Uh, Anja is part of the think tank uh, Neue Ökonomie, and you're a part of the organizers behind the Bits and Bäume um, Congress. And you, uh, in your think tank, you think a lot about uh, implications of uh, digitalization and sustainability. And you, you uh, um, co-author and editor of the of the book of the conference uh, from from the speakers of the um, Bits and Bäume Congress. And you can download it uh, this book, um, and it's a great source of knowledge. You have a talk. Uh, you have had a talk today already. It's uh, the degrowth talk uh, that was two hours ago, and it's one of the topics Anya uh, works on, and also on the camp. Uh, Anya told us about the thing. So we have here a greenie we uh, who we. Uh, invited to the techno uh, tech people and uh, yeah and so you're invited for our um, for our sporangium two three one sporangium uh, it's uh, it's cozy here we will read a we will read a, a fairy tale from the brothers Gaffam. Uh, she takes on her glasses. Okay, so we start with a fairy tale. Once upon a time, there was a country where the resources were scarce and the weather changed. In, in the March, it became really warm, and in the winter, there was no snow. The king of the country knew that there was a. The, the king of the country knew that it was a, implication, a, a consequence of the too high lifestyle of the people. But he knew that uh, if he would challenge his lifestyle, there was a bit uh, big riots. So there were f five uh, business people, uh, and they had ideas on how to change it. So first, one guy said, we want to put all the books away and do it through e-books. And it's easy. Books have to be printed, but uh, e-books uh, uh, work all the time. But from a time later, it showed that the, um, 
that it that it showed that the e-book reader was more en took more energy because statistically it was above 50 e-books that it, it really worked the e-books they could do so then the e-book reader ran out of battery and they had to start a new uh, buy a new e-book reader so the next business person uh, the next business person had a new idea so what about if we we uh, don't print them on CDs, but instead we stream them I from the internet. It's easy, it's simple. That's very c cool, the king said. So everybody streamed in the whole uh, country. A lot of servers were built, a lot of server farms were built. So the streaming was so easy that, so that the people watched more movies uh, in the country. And suddenly, at some time, the big thinkers thought, well, it took much more CO2 than before because it took a lot about CO2. They didn't only stream f movies or series, but also they, um, they streamed s movies they didn't need. Many of, of these were, were uh, many of these server farms were built on, uh, were powered by coal energy. So the king said, well, this is not a good idea, and he got really mad. So the other businessman didn't work so well, said one businessman. But now I have the idea, which, which works really great. When people go out, they often leave the lights on. When, pe when a lot of people do that, then it's a lot of energy. How about we do it with a smart home? So everything is uh, in a network with everything, and then my phone knows that it has to switch off the, f the, the light. And the king said, yes, that's a good idea. In the beginning, the, I the, I the idea seemed to work, but the businessman forgot that it took so much energy uh, t for the, all the technology, and so the energy consumption raised. So he went to the fourth energy, uh, to the fourth businessman. What should we do? The fourth businessman was a little bit nervous, but he took his idea. Don't you think that there's way too much cars on the on the streets? And then, uh, yes, uh, we should have less cars and less less uh, less time. How about we put the uh, automated mobiles, uh, automated cars on the street, and then the and the machines don't make mistakes, so this is much easier, and then there is, and even if we share it, then it's in the end, there is much, much, much less cars. So, the problem was that people didn't want to lose, uh, to get rid of their car, because it's my car, my Netflix account, and so on. The, the automated vehicle, the automated vehicles, also uh, used a lot of energy and a lot of data. In one minute, it used three gigabytes. So now it didn't need uh, only uh, server packs, not only for streamings but also for cars. Everywhere there was a really fast internet necessary. Not ev even in the la latest, uh, in the far farthest corner away, it ne was needed to have this thing. If nobody was helping, uh, who should the king ask? And so there was a fifth uh, businessman to ask. The fifth businessman said, well, now I can give my big idea. My, my, uh, how about we, we solve all problems with one way? How about we s optimize all the all the technologies and all the devices we had so on. The lamps, the cars, the, the servers, the, the streaming, everything will be solved in one problem. The king was really a little bit uh, skeptical because he saw everything fail, but the businessman was really into his idea. How about we make a big strategy where everybody is into it and feels and believes in this strategy? The king said, okay, I believe in you. 
So if we do everything effizient, then the the electricity went down. The electricity consumption went down, but the energy controller came. The energy controller came back and said, "Well, but for some reason, the energy consumption is rising again to exploding levels." They they looked at the electricity bill and they were really happy because it was so low. Every of the consultants of the king was really happy that the, the that the the energy went down, and now he could uh, now they they saved so much money that they could put uh, a new thing a new light for his son who could soccer play at night. Every cons uh, cons consulant of the king had a new. Uh, thing he could he bought because he, with the new extra money, the king had the revelation, and saw that in his country he saw the rebound effect. In a few years ago he saw that in a different country, but but he didn't see when he talked to the fifth uh, businessman. In the end, nobody of the business people had. Uh, kept their promise. So he banned all the five of them. So he decided that all people in the country was allowed to buy new things if the old things were, uh, were, were, for, uh, were broken and there were no better ones there. Also, everybody got an energy uh, budget and they couldn't go over the energy budget. The so he, he invested into the um, public transport. The king searched in the whole country more ex experts to, um, for real solutions. And if this king hasn't died in the meantime, he still lives on. So what's the moral? What's the moral? What's the moral? Wait, wait, wait. What's the moral? It's not like a fairy tale. The real world is not like a fairy tale. Well, thank you, Anya. That was fantastic. Do, do, do you know what you forgot? You forgot the cat videos. Well, so in the next story, please, we would like to see cat videos. All right, here's your air snout in pink. All right, nice. Um, and next, we're going to need you for the random buzzer. I'm going to start this. And you need to say stop. All right, tension mounts, tension mounts. Okay. We have um, seen how to use technology for green goals. That's very important. Um, and we think about networks and how to control them. We've seen how um, how that we need to uh, to make energy green and we need to change our habits. But what we would be at bits and trees if we'd uh, stay with this one-way road? Also, the techies, we techies, have thought about te sustainability for a while, even though we might have not always named it this way. Um, and we found a more uh, comprehensive um, name for it in, in software development. And with this, maybe we can uh, bring the green activists into the boat um, to see things in a new way. Um, so, in, when you talk about software, it's not just about energy, but also other aspects. And these new aspects, Anja will tell you. So, Anja will tell you who will tell us about this. Karina Haupt, Sustainable Software Development for Less Exploding Rockets. Karina, please on stage. So. Hi, Karina. Nice to see you. 
Karina, so if, if for those that don't know Karina, Karina leads the software engineering uh, task force at the uh, DLR, the German Institute for um, Aerospace. And in our context, um, she looks at the research, um, how to support uh, researchers to develop sustainable software. She's also part of the D uh, German research, uh, research Engineers Foundation and open source enthusiast. Um, we are looking forward to eight minutes on sustainable software development. Welcome and thank you. Fagu one Ferangium. Well, yes, thank you very much. Uh, eight minutes, I hope my voice is gonna make it. Um, for one and a half days, I have not spoken, just to be able to give this talk. Right, sustainable software development. For less developer, uh, for less exploding rockets, how the, do the two things relate? I'll tell you in a second. First of all, sustainable software development is something that um, many people use the term, but there's no clear definition. I am not talking about um, uh, uh, running our computers on eco energy. That's not that. It, it, that's certainly a good idea, but that's not. Uh, and also. Um, this is not about building our computers from uh, sustainable materials. Rather, it's about development software in such a manner that it, it can be used in a more sustainable manner. That means that other people can use that software, um, for example, our, our future self in three months. So to be able to use software later, you look, need to look at a couple of p things. Um, I did promise you rockets, so um, here's an, a, an example where th this was tried but failed with sustainability. This is Ariane 5, um, 1996, it's, uh, it's a while back. Um, for the Ariane 4, a uh, control computer was built, it, it, it worked really well, Ariane 4 f flew really well. And the decision was we're, we're going to uh, save some money and resources and use the same software for Ariane 5. So this was the virgin flight of Ariane 5. Um, magnetospheric satellites should have been shot into the orbit. It looked good. The rocket um, started. However, um, soon after a strong course correction was done, the, uh, the uh, rocket took a sharp turn. That's not good. Um, that actually um, extremely high forces are exerted. After 39 seconds, you had a nice firework, or maybe not so nice, um, a very costly firework. It's a 370 million US dollar software bug. It was a software bug. Um, the problem is that if you, so the, the difference um, between Ariane 5 and 4 is 5 is stronger, higher, faster. Uh, five um, had accelerations that were much higher than Ariane 4, which triggered a buffer overflow. And, well, so people thought that if something goes wrong, let's at least dump diagnostic data. So the other piece of the software that interacted with the control computer um, looked at those uh, values and thought they were normal control values and misinterpreted the data, and that's what triggered the uh, course deviation and ultimately the explosion. This is a nice example for sustainable development. Well, it was tried, but if you really want to be sustainable, um, then you need to look at a couple of criteria and meet criteria and develop um, after criteria, and then there need to be tests. Um, so in software development, uh, you have the classical integration tests where you combine components and make sure that they work with each other. Um, so they've done that and uh, tested the entire scenario and indeed the same result um, on the lab bench happened, which is the simulated rocket exploded. Too late now. Um, but the benefit is that this um, really brought some attention um, that there are there there are dangers in developing complex software, and so um, new versions of that software and new methods um, need to be brought in. What you need to do for software development is to look at di different fields: requirements management, software architecture, um, change management. 
design and implementation, there needs to be a process for change management and testing. Of course, we just looked at testing and release management and automation and dependencies. I'm not going to explain all of these because um, that's going to go way beyond my eight minutes. So instead, I'll just look at the minimum um, requirements. So please raise your hand if you have written code, whatever, just a few lines will qualify. All right, that's a lot. Um, so do you pass the minimum criteria? Number one, is your code under version control? Arms up. If Is your code online and under version control? Step two, make sure your code is in a shareable state. What does that mean? So we're talking about, huh, yeah, right. <laughs> code style, <laughs> sorry, um, it's uh, speaking names, it's comments at, at relevant parts, um, using functions, and ideally also have a, a, a speaking um, a file structure. Who does all of these? Okay, that's less people. Number three, add the essential documentation. Yes, I know everybody likes that topic. Um, I'm going to be really brief here. Uh, what I'm talking about is a README. Uh, if you look at uh, re GitHub, many projects don't have a README. Uh, or some do, but uh, but essential information is missing. Like, what is the software named? What does it mean? What is the software good for? What's the purpose? Use two or three sentences to describe the purpose. How do you install the software? What are dependencies? What licenses are brought in through dependencies? How do you, how do you actually start the software? Or how can you contribute to the source? So which of you has a readme that does all or at least most of these things? OK, we're down to very few of you. Number four, please add a, a license file at add your license terms. Um, without license, your code cannot be used in a safe manner. Because if there's no license, it's 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 a gray zone. Um, that really only means you have the rights to the code. Please um, put the license with it with the open source, and that that's what you do. Number five, do a release. Um, just because your code is out there, but if this is anything beyond a really small script, prepare your code, test again. Does it work? Um, uh, document the changes gi uh, uh, and give a release number. And number six, and this is in gray because this is mostly for researchers interesting, um, make, make it possible to cite your code. Um, let people know how to cite your code. This is important for papers. Um, if you are a scientific author, you're, um, you are measured on insights. Um, even though the, the content should be more relevant. If you're interested in this, you can look at the following links. Um, there's guidelines for software engineering that I co-developed, um, and there's others as well. There's the eScience Center checklist. They also develop such guidelines and uh, they have information here and checklists step, step by step to make your code sustainable. Now. Okay, let's see uh, if I get air schnauzed out. Um, I promised Jorkis here is more bonus material. The Mars Polar Lander actually failed too. It was going to land. Um, it put down the, the landing gear and that was actually interpreted as a vibration. The other part of the software interpreted this as we're on ground and the lander was actually still 40 meters above the ground. And so it crashed into the ground. Um, one group knew that this was going to happen or that could happen. The other didn't. And until today, we haven't even found the crater that it made. Thank you very much. I see, Banks, you're getting strict. Very good. OK, great. I think uh, this thing also got a bit hoarse, the, the trumpet thing. It was a nice example for science. Science is knowing why it didn't work afterwards. All right, so thank you. And we are going to have a very suspenseful carousel here. Can it enter now? Tension rising. Okay, 
we had a view on microcosmos cosme or megacosme about a sustainable future and we have learned what sustainability means for technology and has to mean for technology so please note convival tech uh, technology especially andrea fetter has a drawn up a matrix for this what sustainable technology can cover and who decides which features and which functions a technology should have. You can think about it if maybe uh, a survey from a huge company has any uh, consequences for you. But we can't and mustn't forget that a sustainability isn't just an ecology thing, but also a social thing. A lot of these isn't being implemented, is being blocked or is being dragged out. We have a carbon tax that isn't doing much. We have coal uh, power plants that are running longer. Whether they have no clue or no vision or they have a proper agenda, we don't know. But we don't just want to criticize. We want to show what needs to be done and what can be done. And bits and trees has sat down and between tech people, development politics and climate experts we have come to an agreement. So it can't be too hard and maybe politics and the parties could follow our lead, maybe, would be great. Uh, our demands are supported by roughly half a million people like uh, BUND, the Environmental Organization or the Chaos Computer Club. Oh, something's happening. What's what's going on? Stop! We can't have that. Okay, uh, we we're being thrown off the stage. Demands. We have a catalog of demands. That's all great. But the problem with this list of demands is, yeah, you read it, and it's nice, but you just file it somewhere and this can't go on these are demands, they are very important and we can't just let call that a list of demands, we have to call it a manifesto that we are going to defend that we are going to shout out into the world it's a manifesto with 11 theses and we're going to keep on about it we're going to shout it we're going to take it to the heads of people we need to internalize it, we need to shout out into the world. And this is what we are doing now. And I'm not alone. They are the choir of masks. And this is our manifesto. These are the F theses of Bits and Trees. And here we go. Three to one, Sparangium. I just had to say this. All right, we are going to start. First point, uh, the common good. Digitalization must serve the common good. It shall not primarily pursue just economic growth, but it needs to promote social, environmental and development policies. And also we must keep peace objectives in mind. Digitization must contribute to a sustainable transformation of energy, transport, agriculture and resource policy. Moreover, digitization shall foster human rights, climate protection goals as well as the end of hunger and poverty. A sustainable digitization in our definition relies on meaningful, decent work, social justice and sufficient lifestyles. Whoop, whoop! Then, it goes on, second, democratic decisions and democracy. Democracy! Uh, de democratic decisions are basis of a good society. Digitization must be made more democratic in itself and at the same time support democratic processes instead of countering them. It must consistent, uh, consistently be geared towards promoting emancipatory potential, decentralized participation, open innovation, and civil society commitment. Number three, 
Next one. I don't have to tell you this, but I'm going to say this. Data protection. Data protection, freedom from manipulation and informational self-determination shall be promoted both nationally and globally as essential prerequisites, prerequisites for free, democratic, peaceful and sovereign societies. Let's go on. The next thing is very important. Number four, controlling and uh, abolishing monopolies. We need to create basic conditions for controlling digital monopolies in order to enable a self-determined digital economy in the North and the Global South. Existing monopolies of operators of commercial platforms must be broken. Existing monopolies of operators of commercial platforms must be broken, for example, by imposing a mandatory predefined interface for exchange between social media services. We can implement this right away. Number five, education. Obviously. <laughs> Political regulation must begin to see knowledge and education about technology and its consequences as part of the public good. This has to become an elementary component of public knowledge. A critical and emancipatory handling of digital technology should be part of digital education, including the competent handling of false information and hate speech in digital media. We need to be faster. Six, global justice. That's very important. Countries of the global south must have the opportunity to develop their own digitization according to local and national needs. The costs and benefits of this shall be shared equally between all societies. Negative aspects, such as inhumane working conditions, uh, must not be unilaterally passed onto the global south. And in conclusion, really fair trade. Bilateral and multilateral trade agreements must not contain any prohibitions or restrictions regarding taxation, open source disclosure or localization. Then we need, it's a bit long, we need a be excellent to each other. And the problem is, the problem is, if we don't do that, then we need to make this mandatory. Then the technology sector must be made to commit to sustainability and must commit to um, human rights, ecological due diligence. Everything else is just stupid and not on. Next. IT security and software liability, you probably all know this. Bad software has bad consequences. Therefore, we need security liability. So um, the developers um, are liable for the consequences instead of just looking at the dollar signs. Now, long live software. Software must be adaptable to individual use, must be repairable, and must be fit for long-term use, as the, is the case with open source software. Manufacturers must provide security updates throughout the lifetime of hardware devices and make a variant of source code open source um, at the end, instead of just establishing software locks. Whoop, whoop. Then, 11, that's the last uh, thesis. Long live hardware. 
electronic devices must be repairable and recyclable. We have to eradicate planned obsolescence or built in obsolescence of electronic devices. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> How do we accomplish this? Warranty periods must be massively extended. Manufacturers must offer spare parts, repair tools, and know how for everyone to keep it permanently available. This this must go in hand in hand with greater financial support for open workshops or repair cafes, as well as research and development projects geared to the common good. Public funding must be granted to open source products exclusively. Whoop whoop. And the problem is that with these demands, yeah, yeah, of course, you're all right, this is common sense, but tomorrow maybe we won't remember, because in reality, you're just going to go on as before. This is why we're trying to raise awareness uh, for this complex, and that's why I'm going to do a really public stunt. I'm going to break this table now, so that you remember this. So, then we can keep on talking. So, remember these F theses. They are really very, very good. So, common good, whoop, whoop. Long live hardware. This uh, was a 70s, 80s move, but we've moved on. We're doing it differently now. That's why we're going to open up a repair cafe now. One that's geared toward the common good. Come on. More uh, lasting tables, so bye-bye. Oh, just a second. Don't run away! Okay, don't run away, we're going to need you. I, th I think we've lost them. Oh, that was very, very impressive. Oh, please come back. Maybe. Maybe we need to... Yeah, you need to hit the buzzer. No protest without a buzzer. Maybe if you recognize the voice from uh, the one protest or another, because Eleanor likes yodeling at Edel's Nightmare, and this shows that protesting can be fun. And this is why I recommend to you all to go to demonstrations and see if they hear you. And you can join in the yodeling. I love it. Now we're going to come to your task. I'm going to prepare the random generator. So if you think it feels right now, you're going to hit enter. Okay, this, uh, yeah, use this, uh, this button here. Okay, tension mounts, tension mounts. Uh-huh, okay, looks good. Okay, so what I wanted to say, you know, these demands, they're, they're good. And you didn't actually need to, you don't need to remember them. You can look at them at bits and uh, bits und Bäume .org minus Forderungen. And so you understand this. Sustainability is the goal. And technology is just one of the tools to get there. Technology is just like, I'm going to say this bullshit bingo word, like innovation. It's never a goal on its own. Um, it's always meant um, uh, as a, a, a tool. Okay. And uh, so our first uh, central demands are rather large and, and, and put something like democracy at center um, to, be, uh, to get a more green and democratized uh, future. And for that, that's why we'll now listen to how um, um, protecting the climate and protecting data privacy uh, match and so, all right, Victor Schlüter, data privacy, protecting the climate and future. Please welcome. Okay, and these demands can actually be. You can sign these uh, demands, and if you don't do that, you will have to memorize them. Um, or at least very effectively pre uh, um, talk to them. Victor, good to see you on the stage. We know Victor from his active times in, at Amnesty International 2017, 
he has founded um, Digital Freedom and has been active there since. Um, so he's from far away. Um, where, where have you been? Where were you yesterday? You were at Chaos West, okay, um, with the with his punk band, uh, System Absturz, System Crash. It's really worthwhile uh, hearing and listening to. Okay, we are infiltrated with fans already. And by the way, you can dance the thesis. Yes, so we've just seen it. Um, he works in IT security and studies IT security. Victor, this is your floor in three, two, one, Sperangium. Right. I don't need to explain what happened last year. Germany, millions of people protested, took to the street for climate justice and many more internationally. Fridays for Future has a has 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 um, changed the public debate uh, away from immigration to oh there's a climate crisis and if we don't do something uh, many people will die. Um, okay, I think that's great. That's a good direction. Um, I think we all agree that the last year um, has been the step in the right direction, but. The problem is that the climate crisis probably um, endangers many, many, many species and they will become extinct. And on the other hand, um, also Fridays for Future is endangered and will become extinct if everything goes on as it has gone on so far. Because if things continue as they are, then in 15 years there will be no mass movement like Fridays for Future. There can be no such uh, mass movement. And I'm talk about that now. In 2001, two um, airplanes crashed into World Trade Center. As an answer to that, many Western democracies, including the US and Germany, um, have built mass surveillance. So um, you can look at surveillance uh, in surveillance of behavior and surveillance of movement. And of course, that includes information. Uh, in Germany, um, we have Vorratsdatenspeicherung, um, that uh, means uh, collecting undeciphered uh, information. Um, there are also companies that 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 track and uh, and collect all the information that they can get hold of. Um, the messenger backdoors are in the discussion time and again um, to be able to actually um, also sur survey um, ciphered communication. Um, in, when it comes to movement, uh, we have um, targeted uh, a querying of mobile cells and also um, uh, face detection. Well, the problem is that technically you can completely, uh, you, you will know which person is when, where. And um, so compare that to uh, your mobile uh, uh, phone, well, you know, you can never uh, walk around without your face. You're, you're tied up with it. You, you, you cannot get out of this. Um, already we have gapless surveillance of movement and, and, and behavior in Germany. But if you project that into the future for 15 years, then it's very possible that in 15 years, um, completely all movement, all behavior will be uh, tracked. And that, that will be a problem because then it will not be possible to protest without leaving a data trace. Then because um, any time I protest, I will have to uh, do exhibit some behavior. I will have to move to a street. I will have to be where the protest is. If it's not possible to protest without leaving a data trace, then the problem is um, that social mass movements as we know them are not possible. This is because a social mass movement, if you want to participate in it, um, and it's not possible without leaving that data trace, then every time you do that, you need to ask yourself, can, can I do this? Um, 
I, I, in, in all future, I might be confronted with my actions. I might be queried about being at the demonstration. I, I'm going to look at you differently now. Can I afford this? Maybe this person wants to become a uh, employee of the state. Maybe they want a specific health insurance. Um, maybe they need a specific job. Maybe it's really important to never be on a list from the police. Um, so you never know which political system um, we will have in the future. And, and, and so that, that, that is an incalculable risk. Uh, so every person will need to understand whether they can afford that. Also, mass protests usually look like this. There's small groups that are really, really into the, th uh, the topic, and then larger um, sets of people that wouldn't take that that, that support the the topic but don't take great risks, like um, the the school uh, children that took part in the uh, eco protests. Well, it, it sounds funny, but we've had that in Germany. That if you've been at demonstrations, um, you um, had to. Uh, that that was detrimental to you. Um, that was in the, in the 70s. Uh, it, when you wanted to be employee of the state, you were being background checked um, by the Verfassungsschutz. And, and if you um, were too close to the 68 protests, you would not, you would not be able to enter public service. Um, frontline defenders in the last year, um, 200 or 300 um, uh, so it, it, the problem is that if it's not possible anymore to to have so, ma social mass movements, that that is a giant problem for your democracy. It's our best chance to to actually evolve and to uh, get new ideas, find a new c consensus. That's not just abstract for our democracy. We need to do this here and now, and we need to do this for the climate crisis, because I, I think it's, it's our best chance to actually change anything for the climate and to do something for the climate crisis. Um, this was the problem. I'll, I'll get to the solution in just a second after this. If you, if you ask people in campaigning, um, they always say you need a crisis to mobilize people. Um, to, to mobilize them, you need to show them you need to do something now. It, it, it can't wait until next month. It needs to be now. And the climate uh, movement uh, is pretty good at that now. They, 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 they say, well, you need to take to the streets now. You can't wait. In 15 years, your climate is, uh, is defect. Um, in, in, with data priv privacy, we're not quite as good because these conflicts are further uh, ahead in the future. And um, we're not able to... Uh, to teach people that we also need to take the streets now for data privacy. I think we can take, we can use the same methods. Um, we need to go to the streets now, such that in 15 years um, we uh, um, still have a chance to protest without data privacy. In both cases, we now need to become active, such that um, we don't lose something really. Um, uh, what what good is a democracy um, if the climate has collapsed? And on the other hand, um, we need our freedom and the the possibility to to, to protest without leaving data um, um, to to save the climate. And so I think we need to tell the story like this: we need to save the climate, but we also need to save those things that we need to save the climate. And so I think that because mass movements are our best chance to save the movement, we can ask these two things. First, um, climate justice. Second, we need protests without leaving data traces. And that, that you can think of in a future movement that says we need to act now such that our future isn't fucked. Um, and of course, after I've said this, um, so what does all this mean? What are we going to do now? I don't have any recipes. Well, I don't think it was. Well, it wasn't really my idea um, to put these two topics together. That was a bits and trees idea. But I still have uh, um, some asks of you. So please, data data privacy people, please come to the next demonstration for data for for climate and bring all the people from your hackerspace. Liebe Klimaschutzmenschen, 
Dear climate activists, what we now need is transparency, is, is being visible in those groups in which you're organized. Talk about talk about protests, being able to protest without leaving a data trace, and why that is important. And most important, um, come come with us to the next anti-surveillance demonstration. And we don't have a lot of time. <laughs> the, the the climate climate movement has you, has needed 40 years to establish their arguments. We now have 15 arguments. Uh, I'm sure we can do it, but only if we're in it all together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Big applause, please. Great. Thank you very much for this bringing together of movements. And I always take it's a good movement to take other people to, into to demonstrations, specifically if it uh, makes new friendships. Okay, we're going to get to the next uh, carousel to the next, uh, okay, we're hitting the enter button now, and again, the tension mounts. All right, okay. Um, um, let's, let's, let's all organize, organize majorities as we do in a democracy to be able to influence poli politics. We want to be able to do that. Um, make political transparent just um, uh, to, 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 to reach these goals that we just heard. We only have this one chance. I think it's important to, to remember what we heard in the first talk. Um, the climate won't be safe for us, and for many it is too late already. Um, the only thing is we can limit the damage now. But how do we do this together? That's not, that's not so easy if so different people with different um, backgrounds and different understandings uh, want to collaborate. And it needs discipline, it needs possibilities, it needs the right framework. Um, so you can ask, um, how do hackers and eco activists how do they get in the same space? Um, is that even possible? Um, so, between is there anything between black hoodies and white uh, eco-activists? Where is our common ground? How does our common language sound like? Um, how can we make sure that the barriers aren't too high to, to be able to look across the fence? Um, so, that's why we now look at... Uh, uh, Julia will talk about a room for knowledge where we meet to save the world. Welcome, Julia. Thank you very much. Dear Julia, I'm very happy that you're here today. Well, I am as well. You've studied Germanistic and Sociology, and now you're finished. You did that in Jena and Osnabrück, and now you've done your master's as well to function and legitim legitimacy of um, female hacker spaces. Whoever is interested, she did this at um, the Chaos West stage on day one. It's a very enjoyable talk, so you can see it on the internet. You're also around a lot for open knowledge, open data. Um, you're a volunteer at um, Youth Hacks, and you're um, at the Chaos meeting of Osnabrück as well. You're also at the Digital Courage um, University group. So, of course, you're predestinated to help us understand how we can um, work together in spaces and hack our future together. So now I'm saying, and I want to hear all of you here, three, two, one, Sporangium. Thank you very much. I'll start immediately. At first, I brought this, a title and a citation, a quote. Who does, who makes, is right. This is a saying you think, well, it's something that a lot of activists say, that in a lot of activist um, context, doesn't matter if here or in the climate um, activist uh, context. Well, doing things is what makes a difference, and it's what actually works. A lot of people talk, but when you start doing something, it's what changes something. But well, um, last week um, I, I gave in my sociology thesis, my master thesis, and we worked on the topic, how does this um, society actually work? You learn to question everything. 
to question everything that humans actually did in this society and the structures. And then I look at this um, quote and I ask myself, well, who does, who makes is right, but, but who is possible, who's able to, to do, to make? Well, this depends on who has the possibility um, to, and has the tools to actually do or to make. It's one of the most essential things, and one of the most essential things is actually knowledge. So I'd like to add who knows can do, can make, and is right. I'll admit some things um, are missing here. When I do something, something has to happen, right? So first I have to change a part of the world so that something is visible, something is seen. So first I have to create reality. So who knows, can do, can make, can create reality and therefore is right. At least as no one else doubts this and questions this. So now the question is, well, who has the knowledge here in this room? I think there's a lot of people who have a lot of knowledge and have a lot of ideas about um, sustainability and ecology who I've seen on the stage. And there's a lot of people here who have a lot of ideas of technology and who are able in this um, topic. But where can these people come together to share this knowledge and can become active together and save the world? That would be a good plan, I think. So, of course, now I um, have a special um, view on the meeting point between technology and ecology, and I'm asking myself, where's the space for knowledge? So I'm thinking about, um, well, I myself, you've heard it, I've studied Germanistic and sociology. It's pretty far away from topics about technology. Who else is in this, um, in, in this topic of more technology distant realms? Well, it's not so many people. Well, now I'm going to confront you with the um, shocking reality. At first, how important is knowledge? Well, I'll give you an example. I did a, um, an internship with an, I had to work with an Excel sheet with 3,000 um, um, tables. And now um, I had to um, work with these um, columns and um, change them and that was a stupid job for me because I could automate this job. But my chef actually didn't know this. So, well, knowledge is a tool to make jobs easier. A different example was um, at the hackathon. Uh, a politician in the jury was very surprised. What? You can actually encrypt without blockchain? Well, yes, it's possible. So knowledge also is an orientation, of course, because in the media, if you always um, hear, there's um, always a connection between um, cryptocurrencies and blockchain on the other side, then you always think it's the same thing and it's also important for um, encrypting, but it's actually not. So if um, there's a lack of knowledge, or let's say the other way around, when there is knowledge, um, we notice this when we talk with each other and we um, talk with each other in spaces. Well, mostly, sometimes also more on their cell phone, in virtual spaces where we communicate with each other. But still, if we want to meet, if we want to convene, um, to find out who has which knowledge, who can share the knowledge, um, then it's um, obvious that um, knowledge has already to be there so that you can join, so that you can create together. So the question is, what do we actually need so that communication between different peoples is possible? as well as in the virtual, as also in the real world. So, number one, we need usable software, for one. That's our first idea. Yo, usable, of course, is one of the parts of these, um, this word. Um, you can press it and it actually works, but it also means you have to be able to put it together with the idea of democracy. So do I want to use this in the idea of democracy? And a lot of times in the communication devices of big US American um, companies, I'm not sure if I really want to use it if I think about democracy. So that's also a question of what do I want to use, not only what can I use, and that also excludes some people. Number two, we have to share our knowledge so that we can reach something together. This also includes not only the knowledge that, but also the knowledge how to do this. I know that encrypted communication is possible and that a private key should be private, but in the end I might um, put it in a chat accidentally. Oopsie, sorry. 
So it's also important to see how does encrypting, for example, or how do things in general um, work? Because we have a big um, a big problem, it's called digital divide. It's a big societal divide between the people who have knowledge and the people who do not have knowledge, between the people who have access to the internet and those who do not have access to the internet. That actually means knowledge is costly. Not everybody has the access to this knowledge. Not everybody has the time to research, has the, the money to research, has the possibility to research all of this knowledge. So yes, uh, knowledge is costly. And the third point, we can only work together if we share, share resources. Um, when we split the costs, well, we say you may not have um, time because you have to cook. So, okay, you can um, you can cook and we will do other things. We have to actually share the abilities and the resources that we have. So we, if we want to change the world together, we need spaces where we can actually do this. And these actually exist. These are hack spaces. These are places where we share resources and knowledge. And that's what I was looking at in my master's thesis um, to find out, okay, so why, how can we... Um, reach accessibility. Accessibility, another point that's important on the one side, design and language, because of course it's great if all of us in walk around with hoodies and stickers, we have a certain image of ourselves and it gives us identification. Um, but at the same time, for others, this can um, um, seem exclusive. Um, this is the same thing with language. Of course, abbreviations are clear to us, but not always to others. That means that a space is always dependent on how we construct it with our um, actions. That's what we call social construction. So it means it depends on how do I understand a different person. And if we understand it of the person as a woman, for example, and we always ask, so whose girlfriend are you? It really gets the person's nerves. So um, spaces are constructed socially. And if we all want to save the world together, then we should really think about these kind of things. Participation needs the, to, to actually work together, needs the knowledge. And to have the knowledge, means you have to have accessibility. So um, developers, please make good software that's usable for everybody. Cities, please give us the spaces, real spaces, or at least leave us those that we have. And um, people, please live up um, to your values. Because if we want to have accessibility, then you have to um, create it. Think about your action. Think about how you create spaces. If you want to save the world, then please look what is sustainable. And if you really want to live freedom, then, for God's sakes, encrypt your data and show others how to do it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This applause shows that a lot of people are on your side, uh, hopefully. Yeah. Now you may sit down in a second. And where are our uh, ass notes? Here's your ass note. Ah, thank you. I, I know you've been looking forward to this. <laughs> All right. Now we're going to play the same game with you. We are going to start a random generator who is obviously totally smart and who knows who's left. But please, press enter, yes. Tension is rising. Who is still on our list? Now we have seen how we can communicate, how we can organize minorities, what we have to pay attention for, and what we have to pay attention for when we're doing protests so we can take everybody along. We have also seen how important transparency is in sharing information, in questioning things, and how to change politics and society according these societies together. And we only have this one chance. But how does this all work together? You've told us. And so far, we have talked about the now, after the here and now, how we uh, are going to design our togetherness. But now we're going to look at the future. So we're going back to the rockets that we've mentioned. And we're going to an up, on a journey to the stars. Now please read out our last uh, talker. Isabella Herrmann, Utopia Outer Space, the future of humanity in science fiction movies. Welcome, Isabella. So, please take a seat. Hello and welcome, Isabella, nice to have you. We're going to hear about Utopia Outer Space, the future of humanity in science fiction movies. 
She's a political scientist and science fiction fan. And she combines these two interests by examining which sociopolitical values are present in science fiction movies. We're all into science fictions, or at least most of us. And there's not just neutral statements, but uh, technology shows a lot about our societies. Uh, also, she's a festival associate of the yearly uh, Berlin Sci-Fi Film Festival. It's going to happen again next November. Uh, yeah, it's in Berlin, so of course it's in Berlin. Oh, you're all invited. So, you have eight minutes now. And have fun in three, two, one. Sporandium. Yeah, hi, I'm going to take you away at this late midnight hour, I'm going to take you to outer space and I want to show you what science fiction, the genre of the future, can show us about our future in outer space. Maybe one of you has already realized it. This is a picture from Interstellar. The protagonist and his daughter are looking at the stars with great hopes for the future. Now the question is, why do people want uh, or have to, in movies like Interstellar, leave Earth? And we can um, look at the motto of this year's Congress, resource exhaustion. It's simply a fact that us humans are ruthlessly exploiting nature, and so life on Earth has become impossible. So it's always is about the very current topics and it's being extrapolated into space and into the future. Now, the question is, can these science fiction films like Interstellar, where everything has gone wrong already, can they tell us something about how to maybe do it better in the future? So, if us humans, if we can see us more as part of the ecosystem, or if we should maybe invest more into technology. These are the questions. Uh, and there it is. And now we're going to gallop uh, through science fiction movies, four movies in four minutes. So maybe we can uh, find answers to these questions. And who would have thought I'm going to start with Interstellar. And Interstellar isn't set in 2014. It is set 30 years into the future, mid of the 21st century. And in Interstellar, humanity is plagued by sandstorms. Uh, agriculture is down. This can't continue. And therefore, a mission to space started to find a habitable planet somewhere in outer space. And this mission is successful. We, uh, the audience, don't get to see this planet, but we get to see a space habitat on the way there. And if this space habitat is real or just a delusion of the protagonist, uh, that doesn't matter. What is important is that in this space station, in this habitat, we see the ultimate tech fix that uh, makes nature a perfect product of humanity and what do you pick? Of course, you uh, see a thoroughly cultivated piece of the USA where everything is ordered neatly, you have neat fields and they curve upwards like an inception. This is the same uh, director of course. And you get an idea of how it might look on these other planets. It, it's ominous, but maybe you can look for another planet. So let's just continue on as we have done before. And we're doing as before in cargo. It's a bit farther in the fu future, in the 23rd century, and Earth has become inhabitable. And as you can see on the right, you can live in a space station that is like in Blade Runner. It's inhuman, it's cold and inhospitable. And the only hope humanity has is going to Rhea. Rhea is marketed 
as a geoengineered planet and it is habitable and it is fertile. So you can walk around in nice dresses, in fertile fields. It's all really very great. And if you haven't watched the movie yet, spoiler alert, please close your ears now. Ria is just a simulation. And if you buy a ticket to get flown to Ria via a space shuttle, you are going to a uh, cryosleep and you are being locked into the simulation. It's a great example for the ultimate tech fix where all the possibilities are available, but we choose a picture of nature that is again available to nature to exploit at will. At the end of the movie, we realize that Earth is fertile again. And what do we do? We send uh, volunteers to Earth to start a new agricultural production. So history repeating itself. There's also similarities to the film Wall-E. It's set very far in the future, 29th century, and the Earth has become inhabitable and littered with garbage, and the poor cute robot Wally has to clear up our shit. Humans are living on a space station, they're doing well, but they're all degenerates mentally and physically. And when Wally finds this tiny plant, an automatism is triggered that humanity can return to Earth. So as soon as nature has fixed itself even a little bit, we have to go back. In another direction moves the film The Martian. Uh, the starting point is in the year 2035. It's, there's no ecological collapse, but there's just a space mission and some unfortunate circumstances and the protagonist is stranded on Mars and has to fend for himself and has to work for his own survival. What I think is very interesting is the title The Martian because he doesn't become a Martian, he doesn't adapt to Mars. It's the other way around. He stays a human from Earth and adapts Mars to his needs. And the question is that we have to ask ourselves, can we do it differently? Can we conceive of a different idea of humanity? And now I... We need to diverge a little bit from a path and all these Mars and space movies are part of a broader discourse space where it's about fictional and real stories so that we really need to go colonize Mars. And there's uh, Elon Musk and SpaceX and he's a driving force behind this. And if he could, he would probably fly his Tesla to Mars, but that's another talk altogether. Okay, so what does... What has this uh, quick journey taught us? What has it showed us? It has shown that these movies, whether they play in space or back on Earth, there are no real solutions there, but rather uh, they go back to the same old story. And we can see this critically because films that pretend to talk about the future, but uh, they reinforce the status quo. I wouldn't be this quite this critical. I think generally, just as well as the media scientists here, it's not the job of science fiction to show us how to solve problems or how to avoid problems. How should they? It's more a fact that they uh, state that our society has concrete problems, anxieties and questions. And the films that I've showed you are an offer to get to talking about the future. And so I think that's science fiction, as fascinating as it is. Well, live long and prosper, basically. Thank you for this conclusion. Thank you. So please sit down for just a second. Here you have your air snout. So can we please have some spacey feelings on the stage now? So no light, please. Please take out the black light. Sporangium, Greek angion, vessel. 
an almost spherical container of people in which the ideas are created. In most cases, Sparinja have a special mechanism in order to spread the knowledge over great distances as possible. Sparangian of the 36th Chaos Communication Congress. Around the spark, containers of the CCC speakers curls a row of neurons with a strong inner walls and thin outer walls. Initially, the cells are filled with space, but as the knowledge matures on stage, they gradually fill up. The pressure inside the cells changes due to this process. When a critical value is reached, a phenomenon occurs called cavitation. Through the formation of knowledge inside the cells, the cells expand. The strong inner walls now act like a spring under tension. They bend the cell row in the opposite direction. The catapult is loaded. Now the knowledge is thrown out of the spore capsule at high speed. Where the spurls fall on fertile soil, new ideas can thrive. This was Bits and Trees at the 36th uh, communica Chaos Communication Congress. Your translators were Goonies Bro, The Snakey, and Mareike. So we thank all our presenters here. And we also thank our number guy. And uh, thanks to our interpreters in the cabins. And thanks to the VOC. Thanks to all helping angels like Whale who supported us and has organized everything we have needed. And thank you. A big round of applause for all of them. This is for you. Thank you, uh, the content team, for the courage to let us here onto the stage, and maybe for our stage to let the masks onto the stage. Whoop! <laughs> and a huge thanks to uh, my dear friend Marco from uh, Spree for the uh, design and the colorful existence here and to be our emergency hotline if we need it. Uh, new slides in a hurry and if the video was broken. So thank you very much for that. And this is your applause. Please, come on, stand up. Whoop, whoop. And in conclusion, let's just mention to the right bottom, together we can make it. But if you remember, we have to make it together. So thank you all. If you have, come on, proper round of applause.